Hello, everybody. Uh, I think I'm a unique in the crowd and I'm a purely focused biotech guy. So most of you guys will probably run for the hills. Um, so I've got, I usually make four or five bets. This is my second biggest bet right now. Uh, my first biggest is Resolute and I can't really pitch that because it's my day job too, because I joined, because I liked it. Uh, but Aldera, uh, this is a company that like many biotechs in the past has been worth a lot more. Uh, slipped, on, slipped on a banana peel and created some value opportunities. Uh, what you have now is a company that has great science, and I'm happy to go into it at a later point, but it's a uh, reactive aldehyde species inhibitor that slows down the inflammation process at the cellular level, uh, has great data. This is a phase three asset. The banana peel was a complete response last fall and Todd, the CEO, was telling the whole world that he's like, I'm pretty sure it's gonna get, get through, pretty sure it's gonna get through. And when it didn't, it got crushed. So the stock went from like 10 or 11 down to like one and a half. Um, so what he did do before that was raise a bunch of money in case he had to go commercial himself, which he did not wanna do, and he was very clear about that. Uh, so he, had, he went into that Padufa with a bunch of money and a lot of high hopes. What, he did, what, what happened with a November Padufa, he came out in September with a, uh, a letter from the FDA saying, hey, we don't think we're gonna get through this because we think you need one more trial. Great, that happens in biotech all the time. In fact, that's somewhat, when I look for biotechs, and I look at the stocks, some of my favorite biotechs have complete response letters for things that are very solvable. Um, and so when you see that, I think, so I had a small position, I saw that, stock got crushed, I tripled down um, because that's the stuff that you can get through. So what's nice about this one is going into this next, this next sort of set, they had to do one more trial. The one more trial was a three month long chamber study where you, it's for dry eye. Uh, and so you put a patient inside of a room, they throw things in there that gives you dry eye, they test how, how do you feel, and they give you a sort of a qualitative as assessment of you know, itchiness and, and dryness. Um, they make sure that you, you react, they take you out, come back a week later, they do either placebo or drug, pull you out a week later, and if you got placebo, you get drug, so it's a crossover study. Very simple study to run, very simple study to enroll. There are places that do this for a living, there's one in Boston that they're using. Um, this is one of those trials that if like, not many very short putts in biotech, but it's a short putt trial. So, get the CRL, they say, hey, do one, one more short putt trial. They've done one before, not a big deal, it's gotta repeat it. But it is a big deal when you tell the whole world that we're gonna get approved and it's gonna be great, and then you get crushed. Um, so, it's got this great asset, it's got a whole pipeline behind it, but that has no value, it's purely the main asset. One of the amazing things that happened that didn't get a good reaction was as soon as they got the letter from the FDA, a month later they got a deal with AbbVie to co-promote the drug. We'll fully pay for everything, we'll light, we'll, and it's an option, right? So they, they got a million dollars for the option, they got five million dollars for an extension of the option in the event that they got a, the Padufa date, uh, they got a negative Padufa. Um, for them to exercise the option, it's a hundred million dollars to the company, if they get approval, it's $100 million the company, and there's another couple hundred million dollars of milestones, uh, and it's the profit share, it's the way it's set up, so it's a 40-60 split for US and ex-US, it's just a royalty to Aldera. Um, what I know from my experience in big pharma is that big pharmas hate this stuff. They don't wanna deal with this. Um, so to me, I saw this, and I'm like, oh, fantastic, Abby's gonna buy them. Stock went up like maybe 50%, still well below where they were. Um, so what do, you, what do you have now? You have, you have a company worth 240 with 120 million in the bank. You have, they slipped on a banana peel, but they got a very clear path from the FDA to get approval. You have the biz dev risk gone with a great deal from AbbVie that is worth more than the company right now. Um, and then this, this, uh, this phase, this last trial is, is a short putt. Um, so in, in my overall assessment, the upside is that it passes the trial, Abby doesn't wanna deal with a small company, they either buy the asset or buy the company, um, it goes up to $750 billion, somewhere in there. The downside is they don't have to do it, or they don't get the trial, for whatever reason, the drug 
makes you grow tails and blue eyes and what have you. Um, Abby walks away and they have a pipeline that has a bunch of cash. So it probably goes half cash. So that's kind of the up upside downside. So there's not a lot of downside in my head because this is short putt. And one of the reasons why is that there's, so there's two, two things. One is Abby's bought, has licensed this because they had a drug called Restasis. It went off, it went off patent recently, went from a billion four down to like a hundred million. They've got this huge sales force for dry eye disease of this drug that's now generic. You're like, oh, well, if it's generic, why, why does this drug have a, have a deal? Well, their, 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 their drug, Restasis, showed improvements in six months. I'm like, oh, okay, great. I, I'm gonna have dry eye, but I get, I get improvement if I do it every day for six months. Well, that's, man, that's, is that a solution? Not really. These guys, the, the chamber trial is a 100 minute study. They'll see a reaction in 100 minutes. So the reason why Abby loves this is because you've just taken the dry eye market, which is a six month or three month or whoever the competitor is, saying, oh, we'll give you, we're comparing it, uh, if you do it for three months, five months, down to 100 minutes. So you're totally changing the game on dry eye from being sometime in the future I'll have benefit to it's gonna feel better today. Um, and you've got Abby with the sales force who just grew a, drew a drug to a billion four. Um, so, and, and oh, by the way, this Reproxel app, which is their current phase three drug, in a previous chamber study, they won with a p-value of 0 0.0003. And if you guys know the drug world, p-values is, is sort of tells you how, how, how well you succeed. You have to have a p-value of 0.05 to win, to have a 0 0.0003 means there's a 0.0001% chance it doesn't work on the patient. Um, so this is sort of in the slam dunk world, this, this is pretty much slam dunk. So you've got a company with lots of cash, you've got, they've got a clear path to the FDA, repeating a trial they've already done, and they succeeded in a complete way, changing the paradigm in the in, the in space, the market space, um, from a sort of a six month, like, so there's a current competitor that has like a three month, like that's still gonna be immediate versus some time in the future. And then what, what Abby does not wanna do is deal with Aldera. When they, and, and they're gonna have, to, my hypothesis right now is that they don't wanna deal with them soon. If the, if the phase three is positive, which we'll know this month in August, um, then for, in order for Abby to have any ability to sit in front of the FDA and negotiate the label and the warranty, et cetera, they have to exercise their, their option right. So at a minimum, I think they'll exercise their option right this fall. At a maximum, like why do I want this little piss and company to have any say in what's going on with this, with this drug? I'm Abby, like a billion dollars is pocket change. Let's just take them out. They can do whatever with a pipeline. We don't care, get rid of it or buy the asset, whatever it is. Um, so my current hypothesis right now and why I'm buying, uh, I have a bunch, bunch of stock and I'm buying leaps uh, is that the drug will be positive because the short putt trial. And then this fall, Abby's like, eh, get out of here and takes him out. Because right now it's, it's less, than one, less than one year sales of the, of the drug that is lost uh, to buy this company out. And I've talked to Todd, and he's very excited about the potential of taking his pipeline and spinning it out to a new company, which seems to me like a, the conversation's already had. So that's my pitch. Um, it is biotech, there's lots of risk. Don't take it if you don't want it. Uh, but this is a sort of, for me, three to four us, X upside with a downside of half. One. Uh, why make them repeat the trial? So in, in things outside of rare disease, the FDA actually has a requirement that you give me two trials with, this, with a endpoint that you can repeat. Um, what they did with this drug is they actually put out three trials. They put out two trials of one type and this other third trial was, was to get label. And the FDA is like, eh, well, I want two of those too. So understandable, had Todd not, literally had Todd not promised the world, the stock probably wouldn't have blipped when they got the CRL because it said, oh, we now have a very clearly defined path to, to approval. So, okay. Thank you. All right, uh, I'm gonna be presenting Zometica, ticker is ZOM. Um, they're in what I call the vet med tech. Uh, they've got five products. They're focused on improving quality of care for uh, the patients, improving workflow in vet clinics, and improving the profitability uh, for vets. They do have 90 million in cash, but they're burning cash. 
uh, and inside ownership is um, four percent. What I think it's interesting to look at now is stock is kind of bottomed out at 15 cents <laughs> down from three, but they're in an attractive industry, uh, veterinary. Um, it has a, a lot of potential in terms of the business model, so it's a 70% gross margin. It should be low capex, so strong cash flow, and if you look out a couple years, this should be a very nice operating margin, high return type of business. Management has been given specific guidance, so I'll get into that next. It's very much an execution story. You've got a management team and a board that has experience in private companies, public companies, med tech, um, and startups. So it seems like we've got a good combination of the experience that's needed to kind of execute here. I'll skip over uh, this because I'm going to get into all of it in the next slide. Uh, the vet industry is big just like Clifford, the big red dog. Uh, these guys are tiny. They did 25 million in revenue last year. So I, I'm not sure the TAM at this point is super relevant, but if you're interested, there it is. So here's their product portfolio. I'll start with the therapeutics. Their biggest product currently is PulseVet. This is used uh, primarily in the equine market and they're looking to bring it down into small pets. And it is for, um, ligament and tendon as well as osteoarthritis and the system sells for 30,000 the trodes are the recurring revenue piece they sell for 2100 they have about 50 uses and the vet can charge 300 per treatment so the system will pay for itself in the first year and then it's a very high cash generated product for the uh, for the vet that did about, my guesstimate, 19 million in revenue out of the 25 they reported for the year. Next product is the ACC Loop. This is a direct to consumer. This is for pain and inflammation. Uh, vets can also sell this. It tends to be just a one-time purchase, but when it wears out, it tends to last two to three years, they can go ahead and buy another one. Uh, True Forma, so I'll get into the therapeutics. So True Forma is a point of care diagnostic system. They place the system for free and they make all their money on assays uh, for diagnosing different disease states. The initial assays they released are low volume. They're proving the technology. And now look for them to increase to, or build out that portfolio to higher volume assays. The assays sell for 30 to $80 and they're very high margin. The next product is TrueView, which is a digital microscope, and it's claimed to fame as it's the only digital mi microscope that has automatic slide prep. So that's a, a workflow time-saving component. This, again, they place the device, and then it's a, a monthly fee. They also at, a, offer a service if you want or if the vet wants a pathologist. That's an upcharge um, per uh, viewing by the pathologist. And this year, they should also come out with an AI-generated report for every slide that gets uh, read. And then the last product is Vet Guardian. This is for post-surgery, and it is remote monitoring of the pet's vitals. And so what they're trying to prevent here is patients cr crashing uh, post-surgery. It's also works flow because it's real-time monitoring. So it's monitoring the vitals, plus uh, there's video. So that saves time in terms of a vet or the a vet assistant having to check on the patient frequently. Um, that sells for 4,500, and then there's an annual subscription uh, to the cloud service that supports it. Two thirds of their revenue is recurring, uh, and I just touched on that. And then the other third is capital equipment. Uh, the current breakdown, I think I touched on this, but Pulse Vet, 19 million, my estimate. A CC did about four or five million, and then the rest is in diagnostics. So the real opportunity in terms of SAM would be the true forma, but again, that's going to take a little bit of time for that thing to really ramp up. Here's some of the milestones that you can kind of measure them against in terms of this being an execution story. And I think it really distills down to three things, which is, or actually two things, just sales execution. The gross margins in the first quarter were 65.9%. That sh should increase sequentially, exit the year around 70%, and then there's potential upside from there.
But at this point, let's get gross margin back to 70%. The CFO has been adamant about cost control. So you should see costs go down in the second quarter and improve in the back half of the year. So from that, I think it just distills down to sales execution. They hired uh, VP of sales who built the sales organization at HESCA uh, and, and grew the revenue there at HESCA. So I think they've got the right person heading up their sales organization. So it really just comes down to, do they have products that actually work out in the marketplace that that's actually like? That solves your cash flow problem. So 12 months from now, if they've executed, I think this is more than a 30 cent stock because you can start looking beyond in the second half of 25 is when they should hit cash flow break even. They should be on a $50 million annualized run rate. Um, so I, I just think you've got a nice setup in terms of milestones. So uh, the last thing I'll just say is on the assays, that's really important for the true form of product specifically and look for those to come out or more this year and next year and going forward. I already said it, it's all about execution. If they execute, inv increase investor confidence, get a higher stock price, they can revisit the reverse stock split and that potentially based on the timing could get them into the Russell 2000 uh, and the rest could be history. I think it's an attractive valuation just based on EV to sales. Um, they do have seven million in NOLs and that's gonna go up to, they are not gonna be cash taxpayer for quite some time. I think the expectations are low, and like I said, 12 months from now, if they execute, so get four quarters in a row here, and I think this will exceed 30 cents. And that's pretty much it. I think you've got the milestones to just measure them. Second quarter is gonna come up. They're either on track or they're not. Then third, fourth quarter. Um, so if they get three solid quarters, I think this can set up well for uh, revisiting this reverse split, and then also getting into the to the Russell 2000, so that's all I got. Can you talk about the margins for Pulse Vet? Since uh, it sounds like you got a good idea on the numbers for the vet, what the vets get out of it, but what are, what's what com what's the margins that Zometica gets from that? Um, they don't break out specific product margins, uh, so I can't tell you on the system itself, but I can tell you, the vet buys a trode for 2,100. They can use it 50 times at $300, so that's 15,000 on a $2,100 investment. So it's a great return from the vet. And, I, and they can hit break even on the system roughly in the, in the first year. So they get two trodes plus the system, it's roughly 32,000 for that initial purchase. Um, and they think a, a typical vet can go through two to four trodes in a year. So does that kind of help you? But I, I can't give you the specific margins on the trode to the company, um, but just w the profitability to the to the vet. Front pause. So hello, thank you very much uh, for that, for the invitation today, for presenting. Um, so just, oops, sorry, quickly, just no no investment advice. So the so I'm. Um, very happy to introduce Shelly Group. Shelly Group is a company that is uh, transforming the smart home and building automation industry, the Internet of Things. Uh, and it's a company, it's my largest position today at Rauka, uh, in the sense that it's a company that has a core business and it's grounded uh, with um, extraordinary growth, but it has an unbelievable amount of unrecognizable, unrec unrecognized earning potential. So the optionality is huge. So Shelly Group has been um, like a leading designer and distributor for Internet of Things uh, products, which uh, basically enable users to control their appliances, devices, and um, uh, remotely, mostly from uh, from the telephone, from the from the smart home or voice assistants. Is the most they have the most customizable. Um, uh, products in the world. There is no competitor who can do something like that. You can create anything you want at home with, with Shelly. Um, so Shelly products are affordable, easy to install, and open to all system and protocols like Wi-Fi, seed wave. Uh, so that is like opening the ground for anything, not closed applications, nothing of that. Um, so here you can see a, a snapchat, uh, snap the, um, a shot of the, of the company. So 
And what is more interesting of that is that uh, the company is becoming a platform and a technology pr and a, and a provider. And that's something that I believe the market is not um, recognizing. About Shelly Group, very quickly. So Shelly is a Bulgarian company listed in Cetra. It's the first company that is listed in Cetra. It's an extremely profitable company. So gross margins is 50%, uh, EBIT margins around 25%. Uh, net income margins around 21% and they pay a dividend. Despite of that, it's a company that is growing, has grown at a CAGR of 80%, but is expected to grow around 40 to 50%. That growth is only with the core markets and core business. And nothing of what the new avenues of growth that I will explain uh, is included. Uh, and what is happening is the, the customization has enabled that uh, the geeks, the people who are really crazy about how to tweak um, all these products have pushed the marketing for free for the company. Uh, they have 80,000 um, people in the Facebook group, for instance, all sharing ideas. A little bit um, about the avenues of growth of Shelly. So this is, um, so sorry, before of that, uh, I need just to explain. So what are the main core products of Shelly? So the main core product of Shelly right now is the relays, no? So the relays are what you connect behind power outlets and any device that is plugged there becomes a smart and you can monitor it with uh, or, or control it with your application. So this is the most customizable relay in the market. Shell is also uh, in smart switches and is more, uh, is, is smart plugs. Um, but now, and all what is this guidance that I gave that like is continuing to grow to 50% uh, for the foreseeable future, it doesn't include these new avenues of growth. So one is Shelly X. I will expand a little bit uh, later what, what it is, but geographical expansion. So Shelly sells, they say 2024 is going to be around 105 million revenues in euros, 50% that come from Germany. So and now they are expanding very aggressively in what is France, UK, uh, Italy, Australia, uh, US. So if they reach just in Europe the penetration of what is Germany, that will be multiples of the revenues of what Shelly currently does. Um, they have channel expansion, which is now is a direct to consumer, mostly 80%. So they are, they are expanding aggressively to the professional market. And that is doubled, even more, almost three times the size of the direct to consumer market. And the increase of the wallet is once you buy one relay or one device, you will buy more. So now it's on average four devices per household is going to go to eight. Um, and the shell is more up. So you have an app that you pay four euros per month and that will enable to have a lot more features that is, is growing super positive. And look, it's the only company that is really innovating new products. So just 85 new products uh, expected this year to be released. No competitor does it. So just one thing about Shelly X, and this is one of the aspects of why I want to em emphasize that the company is um, a platform. Shelly X is a chip that is going to be installed in other companies' uh, devices. Like, think about an electro Electrolux washing machine. So they need something that makes that machine smart. And that's done not mostly now by a Chinese company called Tuya. They make around, estimated around 150 million devices of this, but they are not open API. They don't have strong warranties. So these clients are really looking for something much, much better. And Shelly has all the capabilities. This has launched just now. So this, is, this can be bigger. Just think about, so Shelly will have a price on that, that it will include 10 years of service, which includes the storage cloud. So the cloud storage costs. And that is huge for, this, for these brands. So that only, so if you think about if you can sell, so 10 million units, if you sell around $3, uh, that would be 30 million. Um, estimated management said that it's around the same gross margin, so 50%, that can translate in 20% net incomes. That would be, if you sell only 10 million units, that would be 6 million. This, only that tiny part would, should be around 30% more market cap of what it is today, which I will go to valuation later. Let's go that. So this is the com competition landscape. So as I said, so Shelly sells the product quite affordable and much better quality. There is Shelly products are open to all protocols, C-Wave, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, a lot of competitors are only into one or are closed systems, not customizable as Shelly is. So it's huge, the, the, um, the difference that Shelly is providing. 
Um, so, and very quickly, main, main development. So, Shelly was, as I said, this uh, release Shelly X. Now they made a partnership with Audi and all the brands related to Volkswagen, which is uh, they're going to have installed into the car system the Shelly app. So, you can control all the, your appliances directly from your car. They bought a company, LOQED, which is in the smart lock system. So, Shelly is expanding into the security systems within the home as well. They bought it for 150,000 euros because they entered bankruptcy. And the inventory is even higher than that, so that will expand even more things that here happen, that I have mentioned. Um, and very quickly, so as I mentioned, so, so I already mentioned that on the PL, so the margins, but in the balance sheet, so Shelly doesn't have any net debt, so it has a net position of 15 million net cash. Um, and um, Let's say uh, cash flow, I expect, so cash flow is, uh, is uh, let's say you can say 60% of, uh, of, of, of EBIT, but I would expect now with the growth avenues that should be using working capital inventory, you know? So that's what I would say, and in valuation, so you could say this is trading at 2024, 20, 31 times earnings, or 30 today with how is the prices now. Um, that's also 20, 22 times around 2025 and 16 times in 2026. Uh, which is a guidance of management, but that doesn't include anything of the avenues of growth that I have mentioned, nothing. So if the US works, if the um, Shelly X works, this is going to be a very conservative guidance. So this is a company that even people think they cannot be Bulgarian. You know, I have met people say, no, they are from the UK and all because they are so good that they, they cannot um, uh, comprehend that. So Anissa is not just a product company, it's a technology provider and a platform. So, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Good morning. So, the company I'm going to pitch is a company that some of you will probably already know because it's a Canadian company called Kraken Robotics, uh, active in marine technology. But so, for those of you who don't know what they do, it's a relatively young company. They started. Uh, developing a type of sonar, synthetic aperture sonar, that is being used more and more now the last couple of years in those unmanned underwater vehicles or underwater drones. And uh, so they started making the sonar and then they sell the sonar to the companies that make the underwater vehicles. But then they wanted to move up the value chain and they started developing their own vehicles and it's called uh, a catfish, and that's the thing you see on the, the picture on the right, the yellow thing. And then they also started making uh, systems to, to launch and retrieve those, those unmanned vehicles. And a couple of years ago, they also did a very smart acquisition of a battery company, specific pressure tolerant batteries that also go into those unmanned vehicles. So now they do the sonars, the batteries, and they also sell the unmanned vehicles. And that's the product side. They also have a smaller service side where they, they do surveys of uh, what you would call critical underwater infrastructure. So you would think about uh, offshore oil and gas uh, infrastructure or offshore wind infrastructure where you need to check if the cables are still uh, intact, not damaged by, by corrosion or last couple of years, maybe also by sabotage. So that's a smaller part, maybe 20% of their, of their sales. But it's interesting because the, the product side is a bit lumpy. The orders can be lumpy. So the service side gives a bit more of a recurring uh, income to smooth out the, the lumpiness. So like I said, they started with sonar, then they moved up the value chain. And uh, to give you an idea, a sonar gets them sales of about between 300 and 700,000 uh, dollars. The catfish system, the, the vehicles, between four and eight million, so that's a big step up for them that now that they can also sell those things. And the batteries is somewhere between half a million and a million for a, for a regular underwater vehicle. But now, the last couple of years, they're starting to become, uh, they're starting to come to market a sort of extra large unmanned vehicles that are the size of school buses. And those types of vehicles uh, need between 5 and 10 million worth of batteries. So that evolution goes on the next, the next years, then their battery revenue is going to increase a lot. So, but since they moved up into the, the, the bigger 
Things like the catches, their sales have grown dramatically in the last couple of years. 2018, they only had 4 million in revenue. Two years ago, it was 41. Last year, it was 70. And this year, they're guiding for between 90 and 100 million. And it's probably going to be closer to 100 than to 90. So I'm not going to go over this one. They have a lot of blue chip customers because of the, the quality of their, their products. They're considered one of, one of the best. And they also have a, a big tailwind because the, all the navies worldwide are doing an, an upgrade cycle of their mine hunting equipment. They're also buying more and more uh, of these underwater drones because uh, warfare is, is changing and, and uh, navies like to have these underwater unmanned uh, vehicles that they can use to, to hunt for mines. So that's a big tailwind for them. So they started getting big Navy contracts the last couple of years. Started in 2020 with uh, the Danish Navy. That was a $36 million contract. Soon after that, they had a, a contract with the Polish Navy. Last year, the end of 22, they had a $50 million contract with the Canadian Navy. So those contracts are getting bigger. And we're probably only in the first innings of the whole uh, upgrade cycle. So the next five years, there's going to be a lot more of those contracts. And the nice thing, of course, is sales have been going up. And together with sales, margins are increasing. Last year was their first year that they were profitable. And uh, so this year, they're guiding, like I said, for between $90 million in revenue, between 18 and 24 in EBITDA. And uh, management is optimistic because they think they can keep growing revenue in the next couple of years at a 40% CAGR and that they can get uh, or keep the margins, the EBITDA margin between 20 and 25% because of that upgrade cycle, because of that battery demand, and because also demand for those surveys is increasing. So and at the beginning of this year, they had the first attempt of, of quantifying what uh, the opportunity was for sales in the coming years. They said for the next couple of years, we see uh, more than 900 million opportunity. Biggest part of that is, like I said, those big contracts for all the, the navies worldwide. They estimated it themselves at more than 600 million. Then there's the battery side that was estimated at 250 million, but that's probably also an, an underestimation. And then you have the survey side, which is smaller, but still an, an 80 million opportunity. And it's interesting, that was what they said at the beginning of the year. A couple of months ago, they said, uh, well, we've probably underestimated the potential because we're still seeing a lot more uh, opportunities. So it's probably going to be, so the opportunity is probably more than 1 billion today. So that's interesting, and, but you're maybe wondering uh, if you've looked at the share price, isn't that baked into the valuation today because the share, uh, the stock has gone up a lot in the past year. And I can say there's good news because the stock is down 6% today. But also, it's not expensive because their peers are trading at an average of 15 times EBITDA. And if next year, they'll probably get uh, 30 million in EBITDA. So if you were to calculate that, that would mean a share price of around $2, 2 Canadian dollars for uh, Kraken. And they're trading below $1.20 today. So still a lot of opportunity. And I would uh, argue that uh, they shouldn't be trading at a discount to their peers or at the same valuation as their peers, but they should be trading at a surplus to their, to their peers because they're growing faster. And I also think the end game here, here is that one of their bigger competitors, because they're competing with multi-billion dollar defense companies and they're winning uh, market share from them, will probably take them out, or one of their biggest customers, Andril, that probably a lot of you have, have heard about. They are also probably a likely candidate to, to take them out. And they've also raised one and a half billion uh, a couple of weeks ago, so they have the money. So I think the end game here is that company will be taken out in one of the next two, three years at a much higher price than today. So thank you. Uh, I'm David Bastian with Kingdom Capital. Um, most of you may remember me as the Children's Place guy. You were here last year. I am not wearing a Children's Place shirt this year. Um, so you guys, uh, you asked me a lot of good questions last year about what could go wrong. Um, but nobody asked, is a competitor going to open up a distribution center down the road from their main campus in Alabama, pressure their labor costs, blow out their third party fees, and squeeze them to the brink of insolvency? 
before a Saudi family office quarters the stock in three days, squeezes it up 500%, fires the entire management team, and then writes a letter to shareholders that they're going to reinvent the company in the spirit of Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. Um, that is what happened. So, um, <laughs> hoping for more uh, foresight in your questions this year. Um, <laughs> nailed this pitch. Um, so I'm going for something easier this year. I decided instead of retail, we would do uh, office real estate. So this is uh, this is not a growth story. This is a liquidation. Um, so net lease office properties. I profiled this on Microcap Club uh, back in December. Since I did that, they have disposed of 12 of their 59 properties from their spinoff from WP Carry. Um, most of those have been at very attractive prices to they handed back the keys on mortgages that were underwater. Um, they paid off half their debt. They've got $243 million left secured by 32 locations. Um, they also have $114 million non-recourse mortgages that are left on seven different locations and they have eight locations that are unencumbered. Um, all that is about 115 million of annual rent with about an average term of five years. They have 88 million in restricted and non-restricted cash. 50 of that is tied to the uh, pooled debt there at the top. Um, the, four, the 425 market cap is, I think about right still. It's been a little volatile the last few days. Um, so all in, you're looking at about a $700 million enterprise value. Uh, I prefer to focus on the $600 million um, because a good number of those mortgages are probably close to or underwater. Um, so you're probably not going to see a whole lot of value there. But the good news is they can just walk away from those ones. And uh, yeah, that, uh, that works out well for their, most of their worst properties are on the non-recourse mortgage. So again, good win. The, the average term on the pooled and un unencumbered locations is closer to six years. Um, but yeah, basically you're looking at 600 million of enterprise value against 600 million of future rent payments. So you're basically buying this thing at the amount of rent they are contractually due to get in the next uh, handful of years. Now you're probably wondering, um, David, are you just pitching me a bunch of 1970s era office towers in the Houston metro area? There is a little bit of that. Um, this is their largest property. The good news is it's got a great lease on it. Um, KBR's headquarters uh, has six years left of rent here at $21 million. Uh, it's a good thing because without that, this would probably be worth about 50 bucks a square foot, maybe less. Um, but with the, with, the mortgage, with the lease they've got on there, you're looking at somewhere in the 100 to 150 million value range, um, even without um, thinking about possible releasing. And uh, yeah, this, this could be a lot worse. But this is the biggest building. It's obviously not the most attractive one you've ever seen. So um, if you pull up the portfolio, I can see why you might stop there. But the good news is there's more. This is their CVS building in uh, Arizona. Um, CVS just cut a deal to extend this le lease for 15 years. Um, if you look online, you'll see this is a $4.3 million lease. That's actually going to go up after the renovation is completed this year. Um, the company has not disclosed how much. They just said it's going to uh, adjust to market rates, which could be north of a million dollar increase. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot of people paying attention to that. It's already under contract. Um, so we'll find out pretty soon how, uh, how good this could be. I think this is going to be a really nice number. Uh, it's a data center, office combo, um, in a good submarket. They just put a ton of money into this. Um, I, I'm thinking this is going to be worth 50 to 75 million on sale. Again, we should know very soon. Not everything is good. Um, this is their uh, one of their remaining buildings of their Blue Cross Blue Shield campus up in yeah, Egan, Minnesota. Um, Blue Cross is consolidated from six buildings to two. They are selling the vacant locations. Um, they are currently listed. They are probably going to sell for 10 to 15 million each, and they also got a payment from Blue Cross um, one for vacating these buildings. Um, so all in, you're probably getting about 30 million from the ones that haven't sold yet. Um, but again, uh, this is a great example of where they took a campus, they consolidated the leases, and uh, they're gonna end up somewhere around like a 10% cap rate on everything here, even though they vacated four out of the six locations. Um, so again, they've, they've been pretty proactive managing this portfolio. And uh, even though the headline numbers on these buildings won't be great, um, the all in that campus, uh, they've done a pretty good job managing potential vacancies. Um, this is fun. This is a binoculars building in Venice Beach, 
uh, California. This is Google's office. Um, this is one where you look at it and you see, oh, they've got a year and a half left at about $3 million a year in rent. Um, how much could this thing really be worth? Well, the good news is comps in the area are north of $1,000 a square foot. Um, so this building at 60,000 square feet, $60 million. Um, so not everything is just worth the remaining rent that you see as a headline. Um, I think this building could easily surprise people with um, both the location and the relative value. Um, not all office submarkets are terrible. Uh, right around the corner, Omnicom has a building leased for four and a half years at $4 million. Um, comps, there's two right down the street that just sold for five and 600 respectively a square foot. Um, rents are probably 50% higher than what Omnicom is currently paying. Um, I know this looks like a warehouse, and yes, the other ones that sold look like warehouses too. It's a creative uh, style in that area. Um, but yeah, they can probably release this thing somewhere in the 67 million a year range. Um, comps are good, uh, 120,000 square feet at $500 a square foot, you got $60 million again. This is the vacant McKesson building um, in the woodland suburbs of Dallas. Um, this is again, one of the only actually vacant locations at the moment. Uh, Howard Hughes dominates this area. Um, they've recently picked up an office uh, around the corner for about 130 a square foot. Uh, again, uh, of all the places you could have a vacant office, this isn't so bad. I think this is probably gonna sell in the 15 to $20 million range. Again, not included in your future rental payments bucket when you're trying to calculate liquidation value here. Uh, it's listed and we should see more soon. Last but not least, we've got uh, PPD has a 10 year lease in the Raleigh suburbs. Um, there's vacant buildings nearby that are selling for over $200 a square foot. Um, with this lease attached and the relative strength in that area for biomedical, I see 50 to 60 million is a very reasonable outcome here. Um, in summary, um, you just add up these, these few key properties and you cover most of the enterprise value just from, from selling these ones. And you know, as I mentioned, there's 47 left. Um, this is only a small portion of them. Um, and you're probably thinking, David, these are probably all the good properties, right? Well, I mean, there were a couple that weren't good in there. Um, and there's also a munitions testing facility, a JP Morgan data center, and uh, a lot more fun stuff in here. So I didn't hit all the good stuff. Um, but just these ones alone, you're going to do all right. So in summary, there's a lot of pressure on the spin when they got dumped from WP Carey. Um, try to call up your, your favorite commercial real estate specialist and ask them to value these properties. No one wants to do it. Uh, it took me months to find anybody who would even call a broker here and talk about where these properties are trading. Um, the debt was expensive. That scared people off. Um, nobody was thinking about the fact they could actually release some buildings. They've actually signed new leases on some of these things. Um, everyone was thinking about it, like what happens if no office buildings ever sign a new lease again. Um, and there was concerns that this was going to take a while. So far, we're, uh, we're only eight months in, and they've sold enough properties to pay off half their debt. Um, this is going to be done in two to three years instead of longer timelines people were afraid of. Um, the good news is, is you're going to get capital returns here once the pool debt is paid off. I think that could be as soon as the end of this year. Um, so your cost basis will start to go down uh, pretty substantially, and then you should be completely out of this thing in probably two to two and a half years. All right, I want to talk about Citizens Bank shares this morning really quick. Um, I didn't even know there was a scoring system, so I didn't even keep that in mind. So um, I titled it from a Kamala Harris quote. I don't know why, because anyways, we won't go there. Um, but what can be unburdened by what has been? Um, in this case, um, Citizens Bank, 100-year-old bank, African-American owned, uh, minority depository institution, CDFI, up 4x in the last two years. Um, wonderful. Um, so yeah, it's quadrupled. So is the play over? Obviously not, or I wouldn't be talking about it. Um, earnings have quadrupled you know, over that time. So the PE ratio is actually still the same. Um, uh, estimated earnings for, for 24 are about $8 a share, and that's where they're at for the on that target for the first half of the year. Um, quick background, like I said, CDFI, MDI, been around for over 100 years, profitable all but two, African-American owned, Atlanta-based, um, Martin Luther King Sr., Martin Luther King yeah, Sr. served on the board, um, so it's very involved in civil rights movement. But the big story, if you hadn't heard about it, it was one of the ESIP recipients, um, Emergency Capital Investment Program recipients, where in 2020 there was a bill 
um, that allocated money to the certain segment of the banking community that was underserved. Um, so they got $95 million of capital in the form of perpetual preferred stock. So it was never going to be redeemed by the government, and it had no dividend for the first two years. Um, and then over time, there, there will be a dividend that's kicking in now at a max of 2%. But anyways, um, at that time, citizens had 53 million of common equity and 22 million of recently raised preferred with a 1% dividend rate from some of the large money center banks that were um, wanting to, to help these type of banks. So it just really, they benefited from some low capital. Like I said, on the ESIP, 2% um, max rate is, is what they'll, they, would, they'll, they will start paying um, this third quarter. Um, if they grow their loan book, they actually get some, they're able to get it lower, um, but you got to grow your loan book a lot. And when the program came out, we were in this low interest rate environment where it's like, oh yeah, over time you could grow your loan book 200% or 400% at least of, and that's not existing loans, it's, it's how many new loans you did versus how many new loans you used to do type of thing. And you're always having roll off with loans and, and maturity, different things. But it could go down to a half percent or one, one and a quarter, but after 10 years, it'll lock at their 10-year their average, but no, no higher than 2%, um, like I said, and it's perpetual. Um, but it, it counts as capital, and that's the key part of the story um, that I think people are missing. It, it can be used as capital to where they can raise deposits and make out loans. Um, banks, like I said, done really well because interest rates have risen, and they haven't been able to really grow their loan books significantly. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on their financials, other than if you look at the very bottom line, this is before they got the money up through June of 2022, you know, they would make a million dollars a quarter or, and sometimes less than that. Um, right at the end, they made 2.6 million, but they got a large grant of a couple million dollars. And it's not unusual for these banks to get grants every year, every other year of, of decent size. But there was nothing really exciting going on there. But then once they got the ESIP money, um, they started to have some growth, you know, interest rate environment changed, so they were able to put that $95 million into treasury securities and start earning a lot of interest. So if I, if I went back, you'll, you'll really see the interest on Fed funds and securities, which was under a half million on each of those, suddenly really ramps up as they were able to put that in at 4 and 5%. Then their loan, you know, their loan book reprices as interest rates go up as well, so that helped a lot. Um, anyway, so their the, the earnings have grown a lot. So. Why does the story have more to play out? It's because this hasn't played out the way the whole program's intended. Yes, they're at six times earnings, but a lot of banks are at six times earnings. In this case, it's somebody that's really got excess capital as well, so it's a very safe bank. Um, but the whole point of the capital was to grow the, the loan book, to, to make additional loans, you know, to raise deposits. $95 million of capital would allow them to grow their, their asset base by up to like a billion dollars. And they, they haven't done that. And what I want to talk about is really the difference of what that makes in earnings, okay? Really quickly. So today, you have $95 million that they got. We'll just say it's, it's out of 5% treasuries. Um, and it would earn five, roughly a little under $5 million pre-tax, $4 million after tax. They have 1.8 million shares outstanding. So a little over $2 a share, it's contributing to their earnings, which is great. It's helping the bank. Um, and, and that's part of what the story is great, and they've used it to buy back stock. They've bought back 10% of their stock. Um, they are allowed to pay out all their earnings, either to return of, of dividends or, or they can do return of capital, they can do share repurchases, um, but they can't really touch the ESIP money. They can't really quote dividend that out or pay it out. But anyways, it, it's done really well, but like I said, this is really suboptimal. Um, and if I compare it to what they could do, they, they currently have a return on assets of over 2%, 2.2, which is really good for banks because love them, most of them want to be above one. But as regulatory capital, being able to leverage it, if they could earn 2% on an additional billion dollars of assets, and that's an after-tax number, you're looking at $11 of earnings per share from that 95 million instead of earning $2 a share. So it's an, an incremental $9 a share that they could earn. Can you do that in six months? No. Can you do it in two years? No. It's going to take a while to, to more than double the size of the bank. Um, but over time, you're getting this potential upside that they can do um, that can massively change the, um, the earnings power of this bank. So you have this, like I said, once again, a suboptimal situation going on. And then I give you, in case they could, uh, and not, I mean, I don't even know if there's any bank at 3% ROA, but they're committed to being a very profitable bank. Um, you know, it would do $16 of, of EPS on top of the, their other six, so it'd be a pro forma $22, but 
like I said, it's been, it's been a great performing bank, but I think it's positioned at a very low risk situation to be one of the best performing banks over the next decade or so. Um, at worst case, you're at six times earnings. You should be able to, to have an, a, an earnings yield there at 16%. You should be able to earn that if nothing changed in the story and the PE didn't expand. But the PE should expand. You're overcapitalized. So you should be able to have a really good earnings even if they don't you know, grow the bank like they're supposed to of how the funds are for. But if they grow this bank as the, the funds are intended, and they can use it for acquisitions as well, but if they can really grow it organically, you have incredible potential at this bank. And I think they could be by far the most profitable ESIP bank, but I think they could be statistically, you know, one of the most profitable banks in the country. Um, and I, I can make a case where as they started to do that, that this bank would then become kind of like the poster child, the positive poster child of, of what the program intended and just um, draw in more attention and actually trade at a premium to, to community banks. Because, I mean, who wouldn't want to be a depositor or a shareholder at, at the best run African American bank that's helping underserved communities and is, and is making shareholders all kinds of money? So that's, that's my story for Citizens Bank Share. I mean, I think you're getting a, a, a free, free option on, on the future to, to have one of the most profitable banks out there um, and all for just six times earnings. Um, your, your risks, it's a bank. You got economic risk. You could get runaway inflation. You could get falling interest rates that's gonna shrink their spread a little bit. But the upside of there, you shrink your spread, you're gonna have suddenly huge interest, I mean, huge loan demand, right? If, if interest rates go back down, if mortgages are, instead of seven are, are down to five and a half or something, you're gonna have a, a lot more mortgage demand. Um, the challenge is gonna be the growth because they've always been a low cost payer on their deposits. And are they gonna be willing to pay up to attract deposits? Or are you gonna have to, in a sense, buy a bank that has a lot of deposits? They're gonna have to work through that. Um, and then there's always a the risk of any bank of bad underwriting. But these guys, are, I've been to their annual meeting. These guys are sharp. I'm not, not at all worried. And I say guys because I'm from California originally. I know Cynthia Day is not a guy. That's the, she is the CEO and, and wonderful. Um, but that's your risks. No, I didn't call them. I talked to them at the annual meeting. Um, I, don't, I, I try not to be an activist. Um, they said they want to be the most profitable bank. They're looking at acquisitions. Um, they're, they're not, their goal isn't to be the biggest, but the most profitable. Um, so, I mean, they say all the right things. When you've bought back 10% of your stock in the last year and a half, you're doing the right things with, with the capital. And, and you're, you know, so they, they've said all the right things. And, and it's a sharp board. I mean, this, the, it's, it's not like, oh, you got the local car dealer or the doctor. I mean, this is people that are on AT&T's board and, and, and different things. It is an incredibly, you know, strong board for the size of bank. Morning, everyone. I'm John Legorg. Um, I'm going to be talking about a, uh, a real high-impact uh, exploration play in British Columbia. It's called Prospect Ridge, uh, Prospect Ridge Resources. Um, it's currently a sub-$20 million market cap, and it's got billion-dollar potential. So um, it hits all a lot of the reasons uh, I like it, um, good management. It's in a, a friendly territory in, in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, they're fully funded. They're drilling now. Um, it's a huge uh, property package, and they've already uh, seen some uh, very good uh, uh, results on surface. It's never been drilled, and I'll just go into it a little bit here. So uh, for starting with management, uh, this is a, uh, an all-star uh, cast. Um, the, uh, the chairman of the board is Simon Ridgeway. He's a bit of a, um, you know, a very successful uh, gentleman. He's built one of the largest silver companies in the world. He's had some other successes as well. Uh, Michael Iverson, I've worked with in the past. I've known him for about 15 years. He's, uh, he's one of the founders of one of the largest uh, silver companies in the world. Uh, and as well, uh, he, he had an exit uh, to Osisco uh, with his uh, gold company a few years ago. Uh, Jan Ducharme, the president who's running the operations there, also has been around the block. He, he was with, uh, uh, with Nile Gold that was sold to Osisco as well. Uh, capital structure, uh, it's, you know, it's okay, uh, but uh, I guess the important part here is about half of it or more is in friendly hands uh, between management and a uh, rock solid uh, investing group, investor group that's been wor working with uh, Mike for you know for 20, 25 years. Uh, and I guess you know in here too, they just raised five million dollars for the exploration uh, plan, uh, project that's uh, going on right now. All right, so if we look here, this is uh, in British Columbia, northern British Columbia. Um, 
yeah, that big triangle there, it's called the Golden Triangle. So it's got some of the most prolific uh, gold uh, producing assets uh, in the world uh, there, as far as like a uh, high level of uh, gold um, per ton. Uh, so there's two of them that are currently in production. There was a few others as well. And there's a, uh, there's a, a prospect there that's 40 million ounces. So I think it's the largest uh, gold uh, reserve in the world. And so just south of that, uh, it's not in that golden triangle, but I'm told that the geology matches uh, the same source rocks and things like that. So you're, you know, you're in good company as far as the, the personality of the, um, the project the prospects there. So if you look below there, you'll see the Holy Grail um, and, uh, and Nouse Creek. That's, uh, that's owned by Prospect Ridge. Um, so it's uh, in, a, in a good uh, location. I, I think you know, that's, that's real important. Uh, you can fly into Terrace, you can drive up there. There's, there's mining roads there, or sorry, logging roads that are, that are close by. It's, uh, you know, it's a big, big pros uh, prospect. It's uh, 700 square kilometers, 100% owned by Prospect Ridge. Uh, I've got some net smelter, they can buy back most of it. Um, again, good, good mining uh, area. Uh, so good place to be working. Uh, lots of uh, talented individuals, lots of um, uh, availability for, for um, lab work, all, the, all those good things. So this is Nouse Creek. I guess we'll just kind of focus on this. Uh, this is what they've been working on primarily. Uh, if you, in the bottom there, you see Copper Ridge. And um, you know some of the samples there, uh, basically, and I'll show you another picture here, but the, the surface anomaly is massive. Um, and you got to really think about the um, the glaciers before this used to all be capped by uh, by snow so and, and ice so you couldn't see what was underneath it and those have receded a bit so everything's exposed this has never been drilled before um, so it's never really been explored until until now uh, you know by a public company so I think uh, you know there's there's some you know previous um, ex, you know uh, uh, mines that were that were run uh, but you know, as far as like modern day exploration, this is, this is, you know, green fields and it's extremely exciting. Um, I guess when you look at some of the, you know, the, the surface samples that they've done, I mean, you got up to over 100 grams per ton uh, off surface. Um, they did, I think when we look at it here, um, they did basically everything surface here, this anomaly, it's, it's large, it's a mile long, it's about a half a mile wide. And again, um, you know, out of those, uh, that close to 20% were over uh, 10 grams per ton, but some of them going up to about 185, things like that. So um, this is gold, silver, uh, copper, uh, lead, and zinc. Um, so, you know, very, uh, very useful <laughs> um, things to be uh, mining. Just more pretty pictures. Uh, there's a strike. So I guess, you know, kind of when you're looking at it, the because it's on the hill, you're able to see the surface, the anomaly, as well as how, how deep it goes, and it looks like it's 350 meters deep. So again, uh, this is all surface stuff, but we're drilling now. So um, fully funded for that, um, you know, we'll, we'll start seeing results, or I guess you know, they'll start pulling uh, core here in the next few weeks, and uh, in the next few months you'll have some uh, uh, some results out, hopefully. I mean, if we see what we're looking for here, you know, it could be uh, extremely uh, impactful. Um, yeah, so raised $5 million, uh, that's all closed. Um, drilling starting now, uh, all the drill permits in are in place. And um, yeah, we'll do some more, they'll do some more uh, service prospecting and, and some of those things as well. So there's, uh, we're fully funded for the whole year. And, you know, hopefully with, uh, with some good results, uh, we'll see something you know, exponential here. And uh, that's kind of it. So, you know, $20 million market cap, potential for a billion dollars over time. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's nice that uh, the Microcap Club made uh, mining uh, mainstream, you know, for this, for this uh, <laughs> conference. So uh, looking forward to today's uh, visit as well. But uh, if anybody has any questions, not, uh, not technical, but uh, I'm not a geologist. Um, but I do like high impact plays. Hey, thanks, John. Um, do you know who owns the uh, net smelter uh, royalty? You think he said it was two two percent or something? On it's three percent. They can you can buy back too. It'd be the the, the prospector. Got it. Whoever okay. put the land package together that sold to uh, to PRR. Let's give John a round of applause. Yeah.
Thank you. Some of the best investment opportunities are often found where others haven't ventured. And usually those are due to structural barriers to entry. And so the Korean stock market is something that I've been looking into lately. There's been structural barriers for foreign investment. December 14th, 2023, they did away with a lot of those barriers. And so I've been fishing around that market as much as I can. And there's one company that has caught my attention and I would like to share with you guys today. It's called JL Technos Co. LTD, ticker symbol 038. 010. And just so you know, right now, like if you go on to interactive brokers, I mean, you can't invest into South Korea. So there's, there's other ways. We'll get into that in a minute. So GL Technos is a South Korean microcap. It's a construction and shipbuilding supplier. It's trading at a ridiculously low multiple, uh, despite a lot of good things happening for it. So it trades at about, I mean, it's lower today, roughly 64 billion Korean won, which equals about $45 million USD. If you take into consideration the cash and a little bit of debt, I mean, we're at roughly at about a 35 million USD company. The interesting part is despite the valuation, which we'll get into, over the past four years, this company has been growing top line quite a bit. They've been growing the gross margin from roughly 10 to 15% per year to now above 20. And I think that's something that's continued to uh, happen. And so you see the EPS here, 2020 with the pandemic, you know, of course, a lot of construction companies were having problems as they're a supplier. Uh, but since then, they've been growing gangbusters. And the ROIC of the business was humdrum, around 10% per year. Now we're well above 20%. And again, I think it's going to continue. So the company focuses on creating deck plates. Now, deck plates are used in the construction of high-rise apartment buildings, nuclear power plants, semiconductor factories, battery factories. And essentially what deck plates are, they're like a corrugated steel that has a rebar put on and it's specific IP that these guys have. I think they have roughly a hundred of them, but they have different segments for different construction purposes. And so you have steel beams and on top of those steel beams is your deck plate and it's used during the concrete pouring process. So it's your, essentially your floor. Now, traditionally, what a lot of construction companies would do is they'd have plywood formwork. So you'd have plywood, and then you'd have to, on site, put the rebar together. So very labor intensive. And so you can see why, since COVID, there's been a lot of adoption of deck plates because labor costs are quite high and construction companies want to save time and money. And so deck plates can be created off site and they can be brought in, and it's very quick to, uh, to implement and pour the concrete and get your floor in there. So that's about roughly 75% of the business. 20% or so is naval ship building, so they have shot blast and steel cutting that they provide for ship, naval ship builders. Big tailwinds for especially the deck plate business. In the previous presidential administration in Korea, two of them ago, I mean, they were very much into nuclear power for South Korea. So they're building lots of nuclear power plants and a lot of the nuclear power plants, I mean, all of them, Jail was the main supplier of deck plates for nuclear power plants. Anyway, the previous administration did away with nuclear power in South Korea. So they stopped construction and the current administration has said, yeah, we really need nuclear power. We need to be at the tippy top and because there's a lot of energy necessity. So they pledged 3.3 trillion won, which is two and a half billion USD for nuclear power. And like I said, jail is the only supplier of deck plates for nuclear power plants. Not only that, you have K and HP, which is Korea Hydro uh, Nuclear Power, which is a publicly traded company. And they have won a bid in the Czech Republic to build a number of nuclear power plants. And who is the main supplier of deck plates for K and HP? Jail. So we have all of that, you know, at the back of Jail Technos. 
Not only that, we have the U.S. Naval Secretary Del Toro saying that the U.S. is far behind China in terms of naval inventory. And so they really want to up their game in, you know, battleships and all that type of stuff. So they've been looking towards South Korea and Japan as the, you know, next best. And so they went over there earlier this year, just trying to get investment into U.S. naval shipbuilding yards. And about a month ago, Hanhua, which was, you know, one of the guys over there, put a bid in for $100 million to buy the Philly shipyard. And so that's already happening. And one of the suppliers of shot blast steel and steel cutting for Hanhua, GL Technos. So you have all of this wonderful, you know, lots of things happening. And the company's training at practically nothing, okay? So it's gone from, you know, I mean, I mean with the net loss and stuff, uh, but then becoming profitable again. But it's, it's down in the dumps. It's been in value purgatory despite all the positive things happening. Competitors, you have Win High Tech, which is slightly smaller competitor uh, with GL Technos with deck plates. They're roughly similar in terms of gross margin. Their operating metrics are not as good. EV to EBIT of seven times. You have Development Advanced Solutions, another deck plate competitor, slightly smaller, again, more, more debt, not as good operating metrics, trading for seven times. GL Technos, one times. Why? I mean, the residential real estate construction market in Korea has been pretty crappy since 2021. But despite that, GL has been growing like gangbusters because of all those tailwinds that I had discussed. And as we said, it's likely to continue. Another thing to mention is also roughly 8% of the business kind of went on halt uh, in October 2023. And they stopped that until June 20th this year that's the rebar and concrete business because there was a safety concern uh, and that is now fully operational. So you have a company that's quality and I think it's going to continue to be above average uh, trading at, you know, bargain basement prices and reason being, I mean, a lot of foreign investors can invest into it. So you either have, now you have to go direct right now. You can do that, which I did. I have a South Korean broker that I went to directly. Boutiques like Robati and a few others that do trade in South Korea right now, I mean, their transaction costs are going to be a bit higher than going directly into a South Korean broker. But at the bottom, we have a couple tweets uh, from a few individuals who are following this and, you know, interactive brokers and some of the other large U.S. brokers are on their heels of opening up access to the South Korean market. And so you have uh, an opportunity to kind of front run all the other people into, you know, an, uh, a market with a lot of companies, you know, some decent, some not, and some good ones that are trading at very, very, very attractive prices. Any questions? Thanks, that was, that was interesting. Um, is it possible it's so cheap because of the shareholding structure? Maybe you can tell us a little bit about Yeah, good question. So shareholding structure, the chairman and CEO, he owns roughly 44% of the company. Uh, one thing I also didn't mention, they have actually bought back stock in the past couple of years. But an interesting thing that I've seen Korean companies do is they put it in a treasury but don't cancel it. Uh, and so there may be a strategic reason why they've done that. I haven't contacted them. I mean, there's a slight language barrier. I speak a little Korean, but I mean, not great. Uh, but he's not, he, the way that they've been operating over the past, you know, five, six years, you see how they're really trying to focus on, you know, creating a, a decent company. But there, there is one, uh, South Korean companies, especially the large ones, are owned by what's called the Chaebols. Chaebol is like a, a family that back in the 30s and 40s was given uh, high governmental assistance. So you have your Samsung, you have your Hyundai. You know, they're owned by specific families and they own like a web and they tend to not be very shareholder friendly at all. And this company, I mean, it's much, much, much tinier. And he, you know, it doesn't seem like they have that type of 
you know, we don't care about, you know, minority shareholders mentality. All right, I think that's about the time we have. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Now, why do you speak a little bit of Korean? Why don't you tell the backstory? So I, I lived in South Korea for about two years. Uh, after I went to school in Boston, I graduated and I taught English uh, to kids in the countryside for about six months. And then I lived in Seoul for about a year and a half, taught business English to multinational CEOs, so Adobe, SaaS, SAP. And uh, so I, you know, quite familiar and long story short I'm actually halfway decent in I'm very rusty right now but uh, so yeah that's why I, I kind of have a, a little edge and you know w with the benefit of like chat GPT I mean that's able to allow me to understand a bit more yeah that's cool thanks John thank you